So, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Martin Lill. I am the Director of International Marketing for Lakeland Industries. And uh, this year, I will have been in the business of protective clothing, especially uh, chemical protective clothing, for 30 years. So that's 30 years involved in the design, development, uh, the manufacture and the sale of industrial protective clothing, particularly chemical protective clothing. That's my expertise. And during the whole of that time, I've been heavily involved in getting pro product certified to CE standards. So I've come to know particularly the chemical protective clothing standards pretty well. And one of the things that I've noticed increasingly in the last few years is the general lack of real understanding of those standards. And it concerns me. And it concerns me because that lack of understanding I can see sometimes means that people think they are protected better than they really are. And that concerns me. So that's what this presentation is about. It's about how CE standards can be very commonly misunderstood. And we're going to look at three particular examples. So to start, I'm going to start my to share my screen now. So you should then see my presentation. <clears throat> Here we go. Let's move that window out of the way a little. And let's start. So hopefully can everyone can hear me, can see the presentation screen, um, avoiding the pitfalls of misunderstanding CE standards. That's what this is about. And the question is, the first question is, are standards that complex? Because one of the reasons that I think standards can be misunderstood is that they can be quite complex and quite difficult to read. Quite often they're quite scientific and that doesn't always help in the phraseology used. But I'm going to give you an example, um, as much for light relief as anything else, but it's an example of a paragraph that we uncovered in the AN 943 standard for gas type protective clothing. <clears throat> and it's a paragraph that is essentially explaining the number of samples that should be used for the required practical performance tests. And I'm going to read it out. This is the paragraph. <clears throat> Four tests shall be carried out. For enhanced robustness suits, two sample suits shall be tested, each being tested by two test subjects. For regular robustness suits, two test subjects shall each test two new sample suits, for four suits in total. Did you get that? No, me neither. Um, I'm not going to try and sort that out now. Uh, I will say I've had, um, I've had quite long conversations with our CE technical manager, and we think we've sort of sorted out what they're actually telling us. But I think it's a good example of how sometimes standards are written in ways that are not as clear as they might be. That's probably an extreme example, but it can be, it is a potential explanation of why sometimes these standards are not as well as understood as we would like them to be. <clears throat> but the real question is, if standards are misunderstood, does it matter? Does it really matter? Because at the end of the day, the purpose of the standards is, you, you choose a product, an item of PPE that meets a standard that is applicable to your industry. So surely, as long as the product meets that standard, then it's safe to use. That seems simple and straightforward. Unfortunately, of course, life is rarely and never as simple as that. And for all sorts of reasons, <coughs> um, an item of PPE that's certified doesn't, it isn't necessarily safe for your particular application. <clears throat> but before we go into the meat of the presentation and look at some examples and the possible consequences of misunderstandings, um, because my, my history and my expertise is in chemical protection, I want to put it into the context of protection against chemicals, because it's this, I think it's in this sector that these sorts of misunderstandings can be particularly problematic. And I always argue that chemicals are more problematic. They are a different type of hazard than most hazards in the workplace. 
So why do I say that? Well, to put it into a bit of context and background, I want to talk about the reality of chemical protection and what it really means or what it might mean. And there's a movie that's worth watching. I don't know if you've, some of you may have seen this movie. It's called Dark Waters. It's a couple of years old now, um, but it has uh, Mark Ruffalo in it, otherwise known as the Hulk, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and it's a good movie, it's a thriller, um, but it's based on a true story. It's the true story of what happened in a chemical plant in Parkersburg in West Virginia in the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s. And one of the gentlemen that worked in that plant was a chap called Ken Wamsley. Nice chap. You can find videos about Ken on the internet, about his experiences. On, the, on, on YouTube, you'll find some. And he's, well, as far as I know, he was still alive. He was certainly still alive a few years ago in his 70s, but uh, he was coping with diseases such as these as a result of coming into contact with a particular chemical in that plant. And that chemical was this, <clears throat> perfluorooctanoic acid. It took me a while to learn to say that, but it's otherwise known as C8 or PFOA to make it easier. And these are some of the health consequences of coming into contact with that particular chemical. Pretty nasty, pretty nasty stuff. And I think you can see that if not life ending, these sort of diseases from that one particular chemical are certainly life changing. And the problem is that chemicals are a different type of hazard to most hazards. So if we take an example of you're on a building site and a brick falls on your head, if that happens, you're going to know about it and you'll know about it immediately. Whether you're wearing a hard hat or not, if a brick falls on your head, it's going to be pretty difficult to not know that it's happened. You'll know immediately. The trouble with chemicals, they're not quite like that. Not always. Some chemicals, of course, will burn immediately, so you would know then. But with many chemicals, they're unseen. If a chemical gets on your skin, you might not even notice. And it could be happening on a daily basis, and you won't notice. Because the consequences are long term. You won't get ill that day or that week, maybe not even that month. It might be months, years, or even decades before the health consequences of your contact with that chemical emerge. And small amounts can be harmful. It depends on the chemical. But of course, the, the extreme example of this is chemical warfare agents, where tiny volumes can kill hundreds or even thousands of people. Now, of course, most most industrial chemicals are not of that order, but certainly with many industrial chemicals, quite small amounts can be harmful. Another problem with chemicals, and bearing in mind there are, well, there are various figures around, but the most authoritative figure I've seen is something like over 8,000 chemicals are in use around the world in chemical plants on a daily basis. And that's increasing all the time as new chemicals are developed. And the problem is that the consequences are not always known, the health consequences. So if you look at safety data sheets for many chemicals, they will say things like uh, may cause cancer or may damage the unborn child. And that's because we don't really know. So that is why with chemicals, chemical protection, you need to build in wide safety margins because it may be that some of the health consequences are not known yet and may, only, may not emerge for five, 10 years in the future. So we have to be very, very careful with chemicals on that score. But on the other hand, as we saw with poor Ken Wamsley, the consequences of contamination in the long term can be catastrophic to your health. If not life ending, then certainly life changing. So I contend that chemicals are a different type of protection to most hazards because you might not notice that you've been contaminated and yet the long-term consequences might be catastrophic and that makes them problematic. And that is why if you read some of the content and the blogs that I write, I, I will stand behind my, my phrase that I sometimes use for chemicals in which I describe them as hidden killers. 
I don't think that's an exaggeration when you take those things into account. So that's the context of chemicals. Let's look at these three examples that I have of where CE standards or tests are misunderstood and that those misunderstandings could have serious consequences. And the first one is the misunderstanding of type tests for chemical suits. So what is a type test? Well, if you are involved in chemical protection, any of you will know that um, there are, the CE standards identify five different types of chemical protection, type one, three, four, five, and six. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you that are still paying attention will be thinking, what happened to type two? Good question. Well, there was a type two, but it was removed in 2015 because essentially nobody used it largely. Um, so five types of chemical protection and each one relates to a different type or form of protection against hazardous chemicals. So type one is gas type protection, type three, four and six are different types of liquid spray or splash protection and type five is for hazardous dust protection, dry particles. So you've got five types of chemical protection and the whole garment test is part of the testing during certification of these products, these, these, uh, this protective clothing. And if you like, the final stage of certification and testing for these products is what is called the whole garment type test. And these are all of the same general format. Basically, um, a test subject wearing the suit that's being tested goes into a spray cabin for the liquid types or into a, a dust chamber for the dust types and is either sprayed with a liquid or the chamber is filled with dust. We won't go into the details, but essentially from that test, you get a pass or a fail result. So you know that if you buy a type three chemical suit, you know that it has passed this test. That's all well and good, that's fine. Where does the misunderstanding come in? Well, unless you know the detail of that test, it's quite reasonable to assume that a pass means you're safe. A pass means there's been no penetration, so you're okay. Unfortunately, that's not what a pass means because the reality of chemical protection with a suit like this is that it is very difficult to guarantee absolutely no penetration. So a pass in each of these tests actually allows some penetration inside the suit quite minimal and it's controlled, but it does allow some penetration. So if you're assuming there's no penetration, that's wrong. And particularly if you look at the type five dust test, the dust protection, the pass or fail criteria actually mean that in each suit, up to 15% of the dust in the surrounding atmosphere might get inside the suit. So up to 15% penetration could still be a pass. And of course, that 15%, because it's a percentage of the dust in the atmosphere around the suit, the greater the, the dust in the atmosphere, the greater the volume or the greater the concentration, then the bigger that number is that may get inside the suit. Does that matter? Well, this is why I put it into the context of chemical protection. Because if you think about what we've just said about chemical hazards, that they're often unseen, contamination may not be noticed, consequences are long term, that up to 15% might matter a lot. And we've got an everyday example of this, of a, of a dry particle of dust that is just like that, asbestos. Asbestos can be harmful in fairly small quantities if it gets in your lungs. And if it gets on your clothing because it's gone into the suit, you may inhale it later on through and then you develop secondary asbestosis. So not understanding what that test really means and understanding the detail might matter a lot. So that's one example. Let's look at the second, excuse me. This is, um, this is an interesting one. This is a more topical example because it's in the medical field. It's still protective clothing. Um, so topical right now for obvious reasons. 
I'll try not to use the C word, but I can't promise it, it, it won't slip out. Um, so this is about the standard for clothing against protect, uh, protection against infect infective agents. Um, I, someone has just raised the hand to ask a question. Can I, can I say um, there'll be a question answer session at the end? So ask a question at that point and then I'll try and answer them then, then rather than interrupting the session for everyone else. So this standard is about misunderstanding. Um, this uh, is about misunderstanding the standard for clothing for protection against infectious agents. So if you read my blogs, particularly on this subject, you will find that I quite often ask the question, do you understand EN14126? EN14126 is the standard that defines the requirements for clothing for protection against infectious agents, so viruses, bacteria, etc. Excuse me. So, what's in that standard? Well, it's actually quite a simple standard, and it contains four tests. Four tests to measure the resistance of the, the fabric of the garment against penetration by different forms of contaminant. So the first one, the ISO 16604, is protection against contaminated pressurized fluids. At the bottom there, we won't go through them all, but at the bottom you can see 22612 is protection against contaminated solid particles. So you've got four different tests that identify protection, the, the, the resistance against penetration of different types of contaminants. And each, the results of each are classified one to six or one to three. So it seems straightforward, where's the problem? Well, the problem comes with this. If you look at either the information provided by some manufacturers of suits or at the specifications by some users, you will find something like this. So the sharp eyed amongst you will be immediately saying, well, I thought you said on the previous slide there was four tests because there's five tests listed here. So are the four tests or are the five tests? Good question. What's this extra one here? ISO 16603. Well, if you remember my original list of tests, it started with 16604. So what's 16603? Let's have a look at what the standard says. This is the relevant clause in the standard. And this is the relevant text that explains. I'll not read it all out, but what that essentially says, and it says here, the synthetic blood test ISO 16603 is used for screening purposes, i.e. to predict the level where a strike through can be expected when performing the bacteriophage test ISO 16604. And then underneath that, you've got the classification table and it clearly says in the description that that classification is for according to the test 16604. So basically, the standard tells us it's pretty clear that 16603 is a precursor test. It's a test that shouldn't be quoted and it's not there to indicate any level of, protect, of, of protection. So why is it being used? Does it matter? Maybe, maybe those tests are equivalent. Maybe you could use either. Well, let's look back at that information. And I will say this is actually information quoted by one product on the market. I'm not gonna say which one, but you can see there it says ISO 16603, a class three of six, um, and that's a classification. We've just seen in the standard, that classification doesn't exist. And it's a test that shouldn't be quoted. But is it equivalent? Look at the result for 16604, it's unclassified. That means it's not even class one. The penetration has occurred at the lowest level. In this case, it's measuring the pressure at which penetration occurs. So penetration in the test that should be used is less than one, it's immediate. So if you're thinking that those are equivalent and you can say that 16603 implies some level of protection, according to the 16604 test, the one that should be used, it doesn't. Does it matter? We're talking about things like coronavirus. Oops, sorry, I said it. Or worse, Ebola. So I think it does matter, at least understanding that might matter very much indeed. 
So that's the second example. Example number three <clears throat> is the big one. This is the one I've talked about for a long time. And I would suggest that this is probably the biggest misunderstanding in P and potentially the one with the biggest consequences. And it's fairly technical. Um, it's not easy to understand this, so you need to put your thinking caps on. I've got mine here. I've got my Yorkshire flat cap thinking cap that I'll put on. Doesn't go very well with the headphones, but there you go. So let's have a look at this. I'll try and understand this in a way that's easy to understand. First thing is how a chemical suit is assessed. When you're choosing a chemical suit to protect against a specific chemical, how do you assess it? How do you decide that it will protect you well? One of the very common things, the most common thing that people do is look at a permeation test. This is a test according to st test standard EN6529. And this test looks something like this. You have a test cell. It is divided into two by a sample of the fabric that you are testing, the fabric from the chemical suit that is shown in the blue line on the diagram. And you introduce the chemical. Let's say the chemical for this test is methyl ethyl kill you to death. And that's introduced into one side of the cell in orange there so that it maintains contact with the fabric. And then basically, without, again, without going into too much detail, but we'll be here all day, the equipment measures the molecules of the chemical permeating through the fabric because permeation is a molecular level event. And what that gives you is a breakthrough, more correctly called the normalized breakthrough. And let's say in this case for our chemical methyl ethyl kill you to death is 120 minutes. So that's the normalized breakthrough that that gives us. So that test is measuring the resistance to permeation of a specific chemical through the suit fabric. So it seems straightforward. So the question is, how do people use that test result? How do people interpret that breakthrough of 120 minutes? Well, I have to say I've visited chemical plants pretty much all over the world in most places. And this is what people assume from that test result. They say, OK, the breakthrough is 120 minutes. So that means that it takes 120 minutes for the chemical to break through the fabric. Therefore, I'm safe to use the suit for up to 120 minutes. Seems straightforward, seems logical. No problem there, except there is a problem because that is completely and utterly wrong. It is a complete misunderstanding of what that test is measuring and what it's telling you. So what is it telling you? What does that test actually measure? Well, it's measuring this. That breakthrough is actually the time until a rate or speed of permeation is reached. So if you think about measuring the movement of a car, you're not measuring when the car first starts to move. You're measuring the time until it reaches a speed of, say, 50 kilometers an hour. The time until it reaches a speed. And in this case, we're measuring the time until the speed of permeation, the rate at which the chemical is permeating through the fabric, reaches one microgram per centimeter squared per minute. So you're not measuring the first breakthrough. You're not measuring when the chemical first breaks through the fabric. So the question, of course, again, is, does this matter? Does it make a difference? Well, to understand that, we need to clearly understand what is happening during that test over time. And the best way of understanding that is to look at a graph of permeation rate. So if we put the time in minutes along the bottom and the rate of permeation on the y-axis in micrograms per centimetre squared, our chemical, methyl ethyl kill you to death, um, and most chemicals will show a curve, something like this, this sort of shape. Not always, you get quite substantial variations with some chemicals, but most will show a curve like this. So in this case, the permeation starts there at 30 minutes and the speed of permeation increases over time until it tails off at a steady steady state permeation at 1.5 micrograms per centimeter squared. 
Now, remember we said that we measure the breakthrough in that test at the speed of one microgram per centimeter squared per minute, which is where we get our breakthrough of 120 minutes in this case. So everybody at the moment, most people are saying, okay, well, the breakthrough is 120 minutes, so I'm safe for 120 minutes. But look, the first breakthrough, the point where the chemical first started permeating through the fabric was identified at 30 minutes. So between that 30 minute point and the 120 minute breakthrough, the chemical has already been permeating through the fabric at an increasing speed. And that volume, that, that, that area below the red line there, that represents the volume per centimeter squared of chemical that has already permeated at the breakthrough of 120 minutes. So that's telling us to stress chemical is already permeating through before the breakthrough, before that breakthrough identified in the test. So in answer to the question, does it matter? Again, think about that in terms of what we've said about many chemical hazards, often unseen. Contamination may not be noticed. The consequences can be long-term, but catastrophic. And that is why I think this is a major problem in the industry because Unless we know more about what is happening in that test over time with a specific chemical, many chemical plants right now could be sitting on a chemical health time bomb. Because of that misinterpretation, they think there is no contamination going on, but there could be some contamination going on. And unless they understand the detail of that test, they simply don't know. So does it matter? Well, it might do. It depends on the toxicity of the chemical. It depends how much of that chemical is needed to cause harm. And it depends on the particular parameters of what is happening in their particular ap application. So I started this presentation with, if standards are misunderstood, does it matter? And we've looked at three specific examples. We saw how the whole suit garment test is misunderstood and people assume that it means no penetration, but it might, especially with dust protection. We looked at the, the general misunderstanding around the N14126 standard for, uh, for infective agent protection. And we looked at the, the widespread misunderstanding of the chemical permeation test and how that means that people assume that there's no contamination happening Whereas in fact, if, they, if you understand the detail, there could be, there could be some contamination occurring. Put those three things together with what we understand about the way chemicals work. And I think these are really critical issues. And these are just, these are just three examples where standards are commonly misunderstood. I could give you another 10 or 20, and in fact, We've produced two ebooks which are free to download that detail similar misunderstandings or myths about CE standards generally relating to chemical protection and also flame and heat protection. And I'm pretty sure that if I spoke to a, a, an expert on hard hats or an expert on respiratory protection, they will say, yeah, there's, there's actually similar sorts of misunderstandings in, in my sector of the industry as well. And it's because we make assumptions about standards. So the, the, the presentation was entitled, Avoiding the Pitfalls. So I guess I should give you a solution or else I won't be doing what the title said. So what's the solution? Well, we do very much have a culture now, don't we, where everybody wants easy solutions. I wish I could give you one, but unfortunately, as with so many cases in life, there is no easy solution. There's no button you can press or switch you can flick that will solve this. Um, a couple of things I would suggest is sign up to our Lakeland blog at the link there. I will send these links to everyone uh, in the next couple of days. Um, on our blog, you will find lots of articles 
uh, educational articles which are looking at problems like this and explaining important issues that we see in chemical and flame and heat protection. And at the moment, we've got a campaign running around a 13 point checklist for chemical suit selection management and use. So in the short time, I would recommend uh, looking into those and signing up to our blog. But what about more generally? What can we do more generally to solve this problem where so many people are misunderstanding standards and it could have consequences? Well, it's an old saying, but it's true. The devil is in the detail. The devil is always in the detail and we need to understand the detail. We need to read standards and under understand them properly. As we saw at the beginning, they're not always easy to read and understand I always think it's a little bit like reading Shakespeare. You have to practice. Um, but I always recommend actually get hold of standards. They're not expensive to buy and read them and understand them. <clears throat> One thing that people need to recognize is that standards define minimum performance requirements. And that means that an item of PPE that is certified is not necessarily suitable for your application because your application might need more than the minimum. So again, you'll only recognize that and understand it if you understand the detail. So don't make assumptions about standards. Don't assume that if PPE is certified, it's safe to use for you to use in your application. Again, you need to go into the detail and understand it. Find out what's in them, what's in the standards, and particularly what the tests are, how they are done, and what they're actually telling you. Because so often, as we saw with the permeation test, those tests are telling you something different from what you thought, and that might be important. Finally, enlist us, enlist our support. And I don't just mean me, I don't just mean Lakeland, but manufacturers of the products, we have out of necessity had to become experts in these standards in order to get products certified. So good manufacturers, we know what we're talking about. So, and we'll be happy to get involved, help train safety managers, talk to safety managers, help train users, get our support. We don't charge for it, usually. So do use us as much as you can. It's what we're here for. And really, the conclusion is become an expert. We all need to become better experts in these standards so that we can use them properly and not make assumptions about them. Because if we don't understand them properly, the danger is that the people that we are providing protection for are not as well protected as we thought, or even worse, they're not protected at all. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I hope you found that interesting, useful. And if there's one thing I would hope that some of you go away with from this presentation is the thought that maybe I need to read that standard. Maybe I need to understand it better. I'm going to give that Martin a little call and ask him to have a chat or whoever is going to help you with that. So thank you very much. Um, as I say, I hope it's been interesting and useful.